Okay, so today we're going to be looking at uh, polycystic ovarian disease, also known as uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, now, uh, what we're going to begin with is a pathophysiology. Uh, primarily, we don't really know why it happens. Uh, what we do know is that you have a high amount of LH production uh, relative to FSH. And the ratio between this is oftentimes 2 to 1. So what does this cause? Well, primarily it's going to cause derangement in the sexual hormones. And that is going to be your testosterone and your estrogen. Um, LH activates your theca cells. Theca cells are found in the ovary and these will produce uh, testosterone. Now, usually the granulosa cells will convert the testosterone into estrogen, but granulosa cells are activated by FSH. So if you have low FSH, you're going to have decreased granulosa cells. And so your testosterone to estrogen is not going to occur. And so primarily you are left with a lot of testosterone. Now, in obese patients, however, um, they in okay, second okay in obese patients um, they have a lot of adipose and adipose has aromatase which will convert um, testosterone into estrone. So in ob obese patients they not only have high testosterone but they also have high amount of estrogen, and this um, can oftentimes lead to other problems such as uh, endometrial hyperplasia which is the effect of estrogen. Now, on top of this, um, for one reason or another, we also have uh, insulin resistance. In other words, it's kind of like having diabetes type 2. Now, why does this occur? Um, it's due to a, uh, the recept not at the receptor level, but the post-receptor level. Uh, something goes wrong with the transduction and it's not really known uh, what is going on but something with the insulin receptor and you know the signal getting transduced intracellularly it's not working um, and so and by the way this is, doesn't really have to do with them being obese uh, this occurs in lean patients and obese patients so it's something independent of being obese or having too much fat now this can lead to uh, some complications Primarily, it can lead to metabolic syndrome. Um, metabolic syndrome is when a patient has diabetes mellitus, type 2, uh, they're obese, um, and they start to have cardiovascular symptoms, and they develop hypertension. Um, and on top of all that, they get dyslipidemia, which is generally caused by testosterone, uh, where you have low HDL, and you have a high LDL, which is going to uh, increase risk for atherosclerosis and the formation of plaques. Now, both of these combined uh, lead to a decrease in um, sexual hormone binding globulin. So what does this mean? Well, sex hormone binding globulin binds to testosterone, and while it's bound to testosterone, uh, it's not active. So you get increased amount of free testosterone, which just further um, accentuates the problem with having uh, high testosterone from the LH. Now, um, this also helps explain why some patients who may have normal testosterone level but show symptoms of hyperandrogenism such as the hirsutism and the acne and uh, all of those things. So, um, what are the symptoms that this can uh, develop in patients? Well, first of all, how is it diagnosed? It's diagnosed when three conditions are met. Uh, the first being anovulation, usually primary, um, hyperandrogenism, and again, this is going to be highlighted when they have, you know, hirsutism, severe acne, uh, alopecia, and finally, uh, polycystic ovaries. And of course, to see this, you do need to do a transvaginal ultrasound uh, to detect this. And usually, 12 is... Um, the number and, and greater than 12 cysts is what you're looking at and also you know a large ovary uh, can suggest this as well. Um, besides these three main symptoms 
uh, there also are other problems as well. Uh, primarily, we have irregular menses. And so what happens is um, they have high estrogen, like we discussed earlier, and there is no progesterone because in order for there to be progesterone, you have to have the development of the follicle and you know there has to be progesterone withdrawal and um, uh, sorry, there has to be ovulation and then the progesterone develops and then there has to be uh, you know progesterone withdrawal to lead to normal menses. But since there's no ovulation, they never have progesterone. And so you have uh, estrogen uh, unopposed and that leads to high levels of endometrial hyperplasia. So the endometrium becomes really thick and it becomes so thick that eventually it just from the sheer weight it starts to fall down and you have heavy irregular bleeding uh, also known as um, menometroragia bleeding okay. um, on top of this you get something called acanthosis nig uh, cans. this is uh, kind of like a dark in color you know dark coloration to the skin in the fold of the neck sometimes in the fingers and this is due to high amounts of insulin um, there's also infertility or in other words subfertility um, developed again they're not having normal ovulation so of course this is going to be developed we also talk, talked about uh, metabolic syndrome and all of those uh, this is going to be the hypertension cardiovascular symptoms, um, dyslipidemia, uh, obesity, and diabetes type 2. And so this is very, very, uh, you know, this needs to be addressed right away to prevent future heart attacks and other symptoms as well. And finally, due to the androgens, uh, there's going to be some hirsutism, uh, acne, alopecia and this has a lot of psychological effects of the women obviously this isn't attractive to them uh, and uh, um, so they, they kind of have low self-esteem and it's something that worries them a lot um, so when you do come across a patient with this uh, what type of investigation would you do now you have to understand even though we have uh, you know a three-step um, uh, diagnosis system. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, in order to be uh, confirmed, you need to have two out of three of these symptoms. So anovulation, hyperandrogenism, or polycystic ovaries. If you have two out of those three, then it gets diagnosed. Still though, this is primarily a diagnosis of exclusion. So we need to exclude all the other factors of anovulation. So this is going to go down to the thyroid, where you're going to be testing the thyroxine levels, T3, uh, T4, and your TSH. You're going to want to, obviously, hyperprolactinemia, so you want to check the prolactin levels. Um, you want to rule out primary ovary, uh, ovary, ovarian failure. Uh, and with this one, they'll have high FSH, high LH, and high estrogen, which is different than um, polycystic ovarian disease, where your LH will be twice your FSH and your estrogen and testosterone will be high, so that's slightly different. Um, you also want to rule out late onset uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and just as a quick recap, that's a problem with the adrenal gland, where you d they do not have either 17-alpha uh, hydroxylase, 21-alpha hydroxylase, or 11-alpha hydroxylase. So to do this, you're gonna primarily look for 17-hydroxy uh, progesterone levels, and you're gonna monitor those in the morning after they're finished fasting. Uh, you also want to rule out androgen tumors. And you would do this by um, looking at, uh, of course, the androgen index. Uh, the androgen index is going to be your testosterone levels divided by your sex hormone binding globulin times 100. Um, and you can also check your uh, DHEAS which is the testosterone that's produced by your adrenal glands. And if they have symptoms of Cushing's, you might want to rule out Cushing's, and this is done with the dexamethasone, the low dose, and the high dose. Um, now, if, you, if all of these come back negative, uh, you're going to then want to do the transvaginal ultrasound. This is when you start looking for polycystic ovary disease. If you have greater than 12 cysts 
in the ovaries um, that you know pretty much confirms it and after that uh, you're going to want to do your two hour glucose tolerance test to see their insulin sensitivity you're going to want to do their BMI you're going to want to look at their lipid profile and you're going to want to look at their BP again metabolic syndrome is what we're worried about here you want to address that right away so um, what would be the treatments for polycystic ovary disease well initially um, just generally you want to uh, have them you know do some diet and exercise uh, why is this well first of all it addresses the metabolic syndrome so you want to decrease the effect of the metabolic syndrome also um, this helps increase insulin sensitivity and this by itself can address many issues such as a fertility issue um, They've shown, they've, they've shown that even a 5 to 10% decrease in weight can help uh, regain some of the fertility that they uh, might want. Now after this, this is pretty easy to do, it's good for everyone to do, but after this, depending on the patient's requirements, uh, you would treat differently. So um, some patients might be wor more worried about the hirsutism, the acne, and the alopecia, so I call that beauty and other, one, other women might be worried about their fertility and unfortunately you do need to pick one over the other why? well to uh, uh, not only beauty but the uh, anovulation and the uh, you know, abnormal menses um, so the first form of treatment for this is just going to be to give them oral contraceptive pills um, what does this do? This primarily the first reason why we give this is because if they have unopposed estrogen this leads to endometrial hyperplasia, which of course then can lead to endometrial cancer. So you want to avoid that. So th this is one reason why you want to give that. And of course, this has the uh, other effects of uh, regulating their menses uh, and all those as well. And, and not only that, but when you, when you give the OCP, the estrogen begins to inhibit the uh, LH this will decrease the androgen and this will help some of the hirsutism and the acne situation so this helps more with beauty but of course if you're taking OCP it's going to lead to infertility so you got to pick one or the other uh, the next um, treatment would be anti-androgen and of course we know that the hirsutism the acne and the alopecia is caused by this so uh, this would directly address that issue uh, and finally you also want to give metformin and actually metformin you can give you know both categories this is kind of a general treatment uh, to increase insulin sensitivity and of course uh, combat some of the metabolic syndrome and all of those so now if fertility is the issue um, then you probably want to you know stop you can't give OCPs so what you want to do is you probably want to give something to increase uh, ovulation and uh, increase the chance of for, uh, for, uh, permeability so you give clomiphene citrate uh, this is going to help induce ovulation and uh, increase the chances of becoming pregnant and there's another another uh, treatment surgical treatment called ovarian drilling um, and this is when you drill four holes you know four to five holes into the ovary um, it's done laparoscopically, so it's you know fairly invasive, uh, but it is uh, it does have a high uh, chance of success. About 70% of women who undergo this do end up getting pregnant, so it's really helpful. How does it work? They say that perhaps the ovary, because one of the problems with polycystic ovarian syndrome is the ovary becomes really dense and there's a lot of uh, stroma, so this helps reduce that, and that somehow helps. Uh, with fertility and you know ovulation so hope that helps see you guys later bye